Okay, happy Sabbath, everyone. And if you've just logged on, we say welcome once more to Wellington SDA Live. And we hope that you'll stay with us through the, the remainder of this study session. We ask and pray that you will go ahead now and do your, your missionary activity, that you will copy this link and that you will share it in your personal WhatsApp group. Repost this link. Let's get others involved in this morning's study. Friends, we are continuing our series, mini-series. It's not really a mini. It's really a mini. I don't think we'll, we'll probably go past 10, 10 parts. On Ezekiel chapter 8 and Ezekiel chapter 9, and this morning's study is entitled, They Turned. And when they turned, it was never to return again, right? They Turned, part 6. Friends, we have been encouraging you guys that we are told in inspiration that as we near the end of time, Focus should be given particularly to the books, the book of Ezekiel, per particular chapters 8 and chapters 9, friends, because where we are <coughs> in the history of the world, in the history of civilization, in the history of the coming of Jesus is clearly defined and marked out in Ezekiel chapter 8. And I'm going to show you today, friends, that we are in the last abomination of Ezekiel chapter 8 and we're getting ready for Ezekiel chapter 9 to be fulfilled. And by the grace of God, next Sabbath, we will now begin to break down the symbols and the similes, uh, the similes and the types, typologies uh, in Ezekiel chapter 9 and see how they have their anti-type in our day. Friends, we are told that there should be less preaching and far more teaching. Friends, we're asking that you will Log with us, come on with us, and, and, and stick with us because, friends, we are teaching this morning. Far more teaching and less preaching. So we're act. Let me turn it down, please. Right? Less, there should be less preaching and far more teaching. Right? Now, when last we left, Ezekiel was lodged in Babylon. He was in Babylon, and God called him from Babylon in vision and showed him what was taking place in Jerusalem. Remember, from Jerusalem to Babylon, Nathan, was how long? Uh, 40 years? 40 years? <laughs> it was 900 miles. That's a long journey. A long journey, and they had to go by foot. And so God is now showing Ezekiel what is happening in Jerusalem. Now, what Ezekiel saw happening in Jerusalem, we've discussed, is a typology. Now, let's go back. Let's kind of just go back and do a little quick synopsis. We learned that Jerusalem was besieged three times by the Babylonians. The third time was a final destruction in Ezekiel chapter 9. Now, in the first time he came, the first year was 605 BC. When he came in 605 BC, Jehoiakim was, was the prisoner. He then came in the year 597 BC, right? Now, when he came in 605, what did he do? He took Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah and Mishael, and he also took uh, the vessels of the Lord's house, brought them to Babylon. These were the same vessels that we see in Daniel chapter 5 that Belshazzar, with his concubines, he was having a little uh, Tammuz party, right? And he used these vessels, desecrated them, the same vessels, right? Now, he came in 597 BC. This time now he comes, Jehoiakim is no longer. Um, the, 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 the king in 605 BC, 597 BC rather, he takes 10,000 captives this time. He takes Ezekiel in 597. But remember, Ezekiel was not a prophet. Ezekiel was called to the prophetic office in the year what? 592 BC while he's in Babylon, right? By that time now, who was the king? Um, Jehoiachim, Jehoiachin was the king, right? Now, the last time, now you're looking at an eight-year span because when he came in 605 BC, there was an eight-year interval that God gave them to turn, but they never turned now. He comes back now. As you read Ezekiel chapter 8 now, the last time he comes is, the, is in the year 586 BC. That is Ezekiel chapter 9. Now, you must understand now that Zedekiah, Jehoiachim, Jehoiachin is no longer is no is no longer king, but Zed Zedekiah, his brother, is king, and there is an eight-year interval. So how long did God bear 
with his people when Zedekiah came on the scene? About eight, eight years, the patience of God. And during those eight years, there were four abominations that were taking place. And they, they were escalating. Now, we've discussed, friends, that Ezekiel 8, in Ezekiel 8, these abominations were transpired in Jerusalem, right? Four, but it is a typology. These abominations will be transpiring, one, amongst God's people in our own personal lives, in our family's lives, but also in God's true church from a, from a corporation, from the leadership perspective. It will be also be transpiring in the wicked world. So, friends, you will see there's three typology amongst God's people in our own personal lives, amongst God's church, the organization, our institution, but among the wicked world. But, friends, was everybody involved in it? No. And by the way, where was God? Where was God in the midst of all these abominations, friends? The Bible says that he was between the cherub. We're going to show you. God did not leave. And, friends, unfortunately, we have some some, some, some late bloomers, some, some jolly one notes, some hurry come up, some one hit wonders, and they have, and, 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 and they, they believe that God is using them because how much views their sermon gets, or how many persons are watching them live on Sabbath, or how many uh, likes. I mean, that, 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 that is asinine. The Bible says, not by their views you shall know them, or by their likes, but by their fruits. What fruits are, is what they're teaching? in par with the word of God and spirit of prophecy. And friends, unfortunately, these ministries are yard and abroad and are using their meager, microscopic, self-centered platform now to, to, to advocate, to vociferate, to vocalize the fact that because the church is in apostasy, that God is now calling people out of the Adventist church organization to join these little, 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 little pop-up churches. Friends, that is not true. That is, that, that is heresy. That is of the devil. That is doctrines of devils, friends. God was still among his people. And friends, wherever God is, I want to be. Now, friends, by no means I am saying now, let's not become extreme now, that man, that one should sit in a church where there is just blatant disregard to biblical counsels. You can take your membership, your family, and I would suggest that, and you go find a small little church within the structure and work with that church, brothers and sisters. Now, friends, let me say this, and I, I want to be clear. You know, there are, there, 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 there are people who have gone out there to do church plans, and that's noble. We need more church plans. When Philip went down to Samaria, nobody gave him authorization. Philip went. But when Philip's church grew, what did he do? Philip reached back to Jerusalem, and he sent for Peter, and Peter came, and Peter organized the work. So there are men who have gone into, into dark places, dark counties, there and their families and a little group of them to do a work. Praise God. But the intent should be as soon as that work grows, by the grace of God, we try to get that work engrafted in the body. Now, now there are instances I know personally where there's a young man doing a wonderful work and he's trying his very hard to get his group under the conference. And the conference president just has a hatred for him. And the conference president told him, not under my dead body. Well, be careful because you will die. Now, so cases are different, but by and by, friends, as much as possible, we should try our best. Whatever work we've started in regards to church plan, reach out to the brethren. Let's see how we can work together because as we call people out of Babylon, we want to call them into God's system of truth, brothers and sisters. That's where I stand. For us to leave the organized churches, there is a call to leave Babylon and the Adventist church is not Babylon. We have Babylonians in it and God's going to take care of them. And friends, as you take your membership and as you go hither and thither, we are not, look, we are not looking for a perfect church. There is no perfect church down here. Am I good? All right. There is no perfect church down here. God never told us to look for a perfect church. He said, look for a perfect Jesus, a perfect message. The church militant will not be pure, but the church triumphant will come out of the church militant. And friend, Ezekiel chapter 8 is a condemnation to all those ministries who have risen, who are calling people out of God's church. I am not going anywhere. 
And as long as I, there's life in my mortal body, I will always be a member of an organized church. I will always be, brothers and sisters. Though they kick me out, I may, I'll go somewhere else. Are you with me, friends? I will, and I will always encourage my family to be a part of organized churches. Now, again, friends, don't, don't miss what I'm saying. I'm not saying that these people who have broken off are hell bound by no means. But upon this particular issue, let's keep it contextualized now. Upon this particular issue, they are wrong. And I make no apologies. And you can sit there and rationalize all you want. You're going to reason yourself into hell. And I'm going to tell you something. It's not just, and you're going to have some self-support ministries who are very disobedient to God, and they're going to be lost. They're going to receive the mark of the beast in their forehead as much as they're warning people not to receive it. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. You think God is impressed about what we put up and what we mail out and how much people watch? That, that does not move God. What moves him is are we, are we being obedient to the principles he has given to us in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy in regards to church organization and how we view organization. So here it is, friends. Not, not, not everybody in, in Jerusalem was doing bad. You're going to see there was a group and not everybody in the world is lawless. We can't say every conference president is, is in apostasy. We can't say every secretary, every treasurer is robbing the money. We can't say every teacher, every pastor. That is, that is madness. Wheat and tear will grow together. They'll be sheep and goat. And God will take care of them. Our job is to pray for them. And when God, when we have a platform, we are to rebuke, reprove, and exhort. That's our mission. Are you with me? So God was there, and I want to be where God was. So friends, as Ezekiel saw the apostasy, the image of jealousy, he thought that was bad. God said, Ezekiel, brace yourself. It's getting worse. Then he saw the abominable beast. Ezekiel said, oh my Lord, I can't believe that. Then he says, hold on, Ezekiel. Then he, then he showed Ezekiel, woman weeping for Tammuz. And we, we, we tarried on this one because we, we showed you that in 2021, people are still weeping for Tammuz. And friends, unfortunately, the Adventist church has joined the bandwagon. Some of the churches, not all. Weeping for Tammuz, we've discussed, has its anti-type in the Easter sunrise service. We've showed you, friends, that Jesus uh, rose on Sunday, not because of the first full moon and vernal equinox, was because of the 16th day of Nisan, which was a wave sheet. Sunday, and friends, I am emphasizing it, S-U-N-D-A-Y, has nothing to do with the resurrection. As a matter of fact, to even equate them is sacrilegious. It has everything to do with the third day of the wave sheet of the 16th of Nisan. It could have been Monday for all we care. And friends, and again, we have come to a point now where we don't know these things. And I pity these people who surround their Easter service service by the resurrection. F far from it. Now, friends, unfortunately, and I've, 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 I've taken down some of these churches' names because I'm not here trying to beat upon them, but I'm just showing you, friends, that where we are, Blank Conference, Adventist musicians featured at the Easter brawl, sunrise service. It is the first time Adventist groups have taken a part in this program. The, the children, Easter sunrise service being practiced. Ecumenicalism. One more, two different churches, two different beliefs join, join in a unique uh, commemoration that made for a happy, harmonious Easter weekend. Friends, over and over we see more churches are being deluded by the fact that they believe that the reason why Christ rose on Sunday was because of the first <laughs> equinox. That is nothing. No, it was because of the wave sheet, friends. And so, friends, we pray for our brethren. And, and listen, when God gives you an opportunity, you better speak up. Do it in love. But you gotta, we got to let our brethren know that these things are offensive to God. I'm telling you. And if, you're, and, and if your children are going to school and you need to go talk to the principal, let him know, listen, you, listen, you got to stop it. At least clear your hands. And warn your children to educate them that we will not take part in these festivities. I'm sorry. I'm going to take them to the beach the day this is going on. We've got to take a stand. We are confusing our children, brothers and sisters. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. Let art, because you're going to find out that when Ezekiel 9 took place, 
children were destroyed. This is not some bedtime story. This is real. This thing happened in 586 BC. It's getting ready to happen again. They began with the ancient men. The ancient men. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So when Ezekiel saw this, he said, oh. But then the Bible says now, in verse 16, then he said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Question. Turn he again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than these, the last of the four. Now, let's take our lessons now, our study guides. Filling in the blanks, the texts are coming from the KJV version. Number one, now, what did the last abomination entail? Friends, look at it now. There are only three more verses left. And we've discussed that we are living in these three verses. Today, civilization, humanity, you and I are lodged or dislodged between verses 16 and verses 18 of Ezekiel chapter 8. There's no more verses. The next chapter is Ezekiel 9. The Bible says now, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Watch it now. And I beheld at the door of the temple, between the porch underscore, we're going to break it down, porch on the altar, there were five and twenty men, twenty-five men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worship not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N towards the east. Friends, the last abomination in Ezekiel's day was the worshiping of the sun. What was so bad about that, friends? We're going to look at the type. It must have its anti-type. What is the anti-type of that? Friends, now the thing, as I, as I, as I assess this, this, this apostasy, fill it in now. The thing that made this sin so heinous and grievous in the sight of God was that it placed the creature mm, Above the creator. That was what made the sin so heinous. What do you mean? Now friends, we've showed you that when we look at the last two apostasies, we must apply the word there is explicit and implicit. So watch it now. There are a lot of things that, that are not explicitly stated in the text. Well, we know they worship the sun. That's explicitly. But there are a lot of things that were that is tied towards sun worship. It had to be done, right? So a lot of things that were happening, we're going to see now, it's not in the text. But because they worship the sun, it's a package. We're going to show you, right? Now, Paul said, one of the sins of the last days, and we are seeing it today, friends. Romans 1.25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and did what? And worshipped and served the what? The creature more than the what? The creator. The sun is a creature. It was created on the what? Third day? Look it up. Put it in a chat group. Don't guess. What, 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 what day was the sun created? I probably should have put it. I should, I should know this. I, I'll, know it, I'll know it tomorrow. <laughs> right? The sun was created. By who? God created the world through Jesus Christ. It was spoken to existence. So they, they began to worship the sun above the S-O-N. Creature worship. And today, friends, isn't it the same thing? We idolize people. We deify people. We worship people. We want to be like that. We want to be like them. Now, we can have aspirations. That is nothing wrong with that, friends. But when you come to a point where you're going to yield your, your total will, your whole being, your whole body to an object, it is idolatry. They worship the creature more than the creator. And Moses had warned them. So this was not, listen, you're going to see that this sin is not ignorance. It was written in the books. In the, in the Pentateuch, Moses wrote in the spirit of prophecy in Deuteronomy 17, right? If there be found among you within any of your gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a man or woman that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God in transgression of his covenant, 
and hath gone and served other gods and worship them either the what? Sun or the moon or the host of heaven which I commanded thee not. So there was a direct, direct condemnation for people, for Israel, not to do this. Look at what happened to them now. The Bible says now, Then shalt thou bring that man or that woman which have committed that wickedness. Friends, when we pay homage to the son, it's wickedness. What happened to them now? And thou shalt stone them with stones till they die. Full stop. You talk about a, a lovey-dovey God. This is, this is God speaking. In Israel, if people were brazen enough to begin to worship, and you're going to find they were stoned. They were destroyed in Ezekiel 9, friends. This is serious. The worshiping of the sun is something you want to run from. As a matter of fact, I would not affiliate myself with anybody who is pushing, promoting sun worship vehemently. I would pray for them. I would be cordial, yes. But friends, by and by, I cannot go into business. I can't marry. I can't. No! That's, that's your end. If you don't turn, that's your end. No, friends. We could be kind and respectful. We could be cordial. Yes. But by and by, we not link up in no, no, sir. That's the word of God. Now, friends, unfortunately, outside the ranks of Israel, sun worship, ever since the dawn of civilization, men have always been infatuated, fixated, fascinated, by the sun. Every culture worship the sun. And if they're worshiping the sun, they're worshiping Nimrod. Go back to that chart I gave you. Where when they left the Tower of Babel, they took their religion with them. And all these nations worship Nimrod under a different name. The Egyptians honored Ra as the sun god. And they worship the sun because the sun was a source of life. So they thought. And power and energy, light and warmth. The Greeks honored Helios as the sun god, which is similar to Ra in many aspects. Homer described Helios as giving light both to God and man. You're going to find over and over, even the Native American Indian culture, right? Can't pronounce your name, but that the sun was recognized as the life. Many plain tribes still perform sun dances each year, venerating the sun. They're not dancing around Jesus. And so outside of Israel, the whole world worshipped the sun. Now friends, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Sun worship ceremonies still is in existence even in Christianity. People sing hymns to the sun. There's a couple of hymns, even in our inal. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Yeah, have mercy. Let us break bread together on our knees. Communion. Let us break bread. When I fall on my knees with my face to the right. Friends, we sing it. We don't know what we're singing. Right? Vast majority of Christians today are worshiping the sun on Sunday. You get that, friends? The anti-type of sun worship is Sunday worship. That's history. But here it was being practiced by Israel. They knew better. Therefore, God expected them to do better. William Tyler Olot wrote in his book, The Sun Law of All Ages, published in 1914, that the worship of the sun was considerable idolatrous and thus sometimes to be the foundation of forbidding uh, once Christianity gained religious foothold. He says this now, profound. Please read on. Nothing proves? Nothing proves so much the antiquity of solar idolatry as the care Moses took to prohibit it. Uh-huh. Take care, said he to the Israelites, lest when you lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun, the moon, and all the stars, 
you may be seduced and drawn away to pay worship and adoration to the creatures which the Lord your God <coughs> has made for the service of all the nations under heaven. Mm -hmm. Then we have the mention of Josiah taking away the horses that the king of Judah had given to the sun and burning the chariots of the sun with fire. These references agree perfectly with the recognition in Palmri, Palmra of the sun lord, Baal, Shemesh, and with the identification of the Assyrian bell. And the Tyrian, Tyrian, Baal, 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 I don't know, with the sun. All right, so friend, even his historian, even a historian would draw biblical reference in his book to show that sun worship was forbidden. And when they worshiped the sun in Israel, they were worshiping Nimrod. In other countries, in, in, in the Phoenicians, it was Baal and Bacchus. But the point is, they, it was forbidden by God. Now, Let's look at the text now. We're going to tarry in these three verses now, right? Now, who were these 25 men? The Bible says now, were about 20 and 5 men. Who were they? Now, friends, in order for us to identify, give me a minute, please. I need to, I don't want this to open up. Let me just um, do something right here. Please pardon me. All right. Now, in order for us to really identify who these 25 men are, there are three things that we must focus on. One, fill it in now, the location. The location lets us know who these men are. The Bible says, look at the location now. 25 men, and he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and I beheld at the door of the temple between the porch and the what? Altar. So where were these men? These men were between the porch on the altar. If you read Joel chapter 2 verse 17, Joel says, Let the ministers and the priest weep between the porch and the altar. So the porch... And the altar was a place where the ministers or the priests stood. These men stood where the priests would normally stand to bless the people of God. So their location, the location lets us know who these men are. We are not guessing. Number two, the number, the number is important. There were 25, not 20 or 19, or 70, or 40, or 7. The Bible lists the specific number 25. Why 25? If you read 1 Chronicles 24, 23 and 24, verse 4 probably, preferably, when the sanctuary was being established, there were two men chosen from each tribe as a representative, right? 2 times 12 is what? 24. So why 25? Right? Because you had a high priest. So most scholars believe now that the two from each tribe of Israel with either the king, Zedekiah, which he sanctioned it, or the high priest at their head. So here we see, friends, that the whole, the total leadership was given into son worship. Now, now, friends, yes, a shame, but did it mean that they continued? I'm going to show you that next that, that next Lord's Day, that I believe, based on what I've read, that some of them repented, some of them turned. But at this particular point in history, when Ezekiel saw them, the whole Jewish council, the whole head, it is said, fish go bad in the head first. The head, the Bible calls them the ancient man in Ezekiel 9. Now, friends, you must understand, the number is significant. The ancient man, now, so we know who they are. We're not guessing. These are not Charlotte, they were not lay people. Now, in, in the and now, these 25 men do have an anti-type. We're gonna break it down next week. But as it is historically, these men were representative from each of the 12 tribes with either Zedekiah as the head or the high priest. Remember, go back to Revelation chapter um, 5. There are 24 
elders, 24 helpers with Jesus Christ, the high priest, 25. You're going to find 25 is a number that we see all through Bible. The whole head. The whole head was worshiping the son. And if the head is bad, then the body is going to be crooked. And you can't think crooked and walk straight. Now, their posture is important. Their posture. The Bible tells us their posture. Look at the friend, listen, so you, you got to look at the text, brethren. Look at the text. And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house. And I beheld at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar, 25 men with their backs toward the temple of God. Right? And their face towards the east, and they worship. In the Greek, in the Hebrew, it means prakonisto. They prostrated themselves down. The position lets us on this was not by accident or incident. This was intentional. It was. Their posture. Feel it now. Their posture. Their backs towards the Lord. These worshippers showed uh, their contempt for God by standing or kneeling in a way that had their backs towards the temple while they reverenced the S-U-N. Worshipping the creature rather than the creator. Friends. Look at the text. These were priests, Levites, the king. These were men who lift up holy hands. These were men who were getting paid from the tithe. These were men who people were taught to reverence explicitly. Now, friends, brace yourself for question number three now. Because, see, we want to make this study very personal and practical. Number three now, Lizzie. How did these men regard their actions? Were they sorry? The Bible, this, this Ezekiel chapter 17 is, eight, 17, verse 17 is so pregnant. The Bible says now, And he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit these abominations which they commit here? They have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put a branch before their nose. The Bible says, is it a light thing to the house of Israel that they commit these? Friends, they regard it as a light thing, as a trivial thing. Oh, it's nothing. It's just me expressing my emancipation. I mean, you know, come on. After all, God created the sun. And so the logic now, when I worship, you know, and that is why the, 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 I was, I remember I was in, I took a religious class when I was in, in school up north. And it was, it was a Catholic school. And it was a priest who was teaching the class. And boy, we, listen, we, I, give, I give that priest headache every day. <laughs> and he was trying to justify the reason why the Catholics venerate objects and this was his 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 rationale he says we don't worship the object the cross the crucifix we are worshiping god through the crucifix now how do you get around that one if that's not some sly rationalization well, i don't know what and the class was like mm, i see but i was incredulous even though i was in my unregenerate state getting ready to break the sabbath <laughs> coming up saturday i'm saying but friends that's the rationale. They begin to rationalize, well, you know, we're worshiping God through the sun after all. Like sun, like sun. Friends, they, they thought it was a light thing. But watch it now. Was it light to God? The text says that it provoked him to anger. Weeping for Tammuz provoked him. This provoked God. When God gets provoked. Note, friends. These leaders regarded it as a trivial thing. However, God did not. This did not just affect them. It also affected society. How do I know? Look at the text. The text says, because of their actions, they have filled the land with violence. With violence. Right? Go back to my reading now, right? Right? It didn't just affect them. It also affected and infected society. Their rejection of God 
and his true worship led, led to a breakdown in a social order. We are told, friends, that the sins of the world lies at the church's door. Yes, the leaders of Judah were not content to provoke the Lord with their abomination. They had also filled the land with violence, social chaos, and injustice, brothers and sisters. Fish go bad at the head. And that's why we are told in Spirit of Prophecy, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 323, of all the sins that God will punish, none are more grievous in his sight than those who encourage others to do evil. Those who head up apostasy. And that's why, friends, you've got to pray for our leadership. When a man gets hired as a pastor, you got to pray for him because the spirituality of the congregation rests on him. If he compromises nine out of ten times, the congregation will compromise. We've got to pray for our leadership. Now, so they thought it was a light thing. Now, friends, to add insult to injury, to kick a man when he's down, to pour salt in the wounds, look what they did now. Verse number four, Christian four says now, what did they put to their nose? Ezekiel 8, 17 says now, and lo, they put a branch to their nose. A branch. Was this a real branch? Or was this a, a idiom? Was it a palm branch, a nestle branch, a fig branch? They put a branch to their nose. Note, friends, this is an unusual statement used only here in the Old Testament. Some take it as a gesture of contempt towards God. Many Bible scholars, and I've researched it, liken this as the thumping of the nose towards God. Like, what you going to do, God? They thump their nose at God. Huh? In the midst, in this, it's one thing to do wrong and do your wrong quietly. It is one thing to do wrong and to challenge God to do something about you doing your wrong. That's exactly what they were doing when the Bible says that they thump. The Bible, they, 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 they put a branch to your nose. Note, right? Uh, sticking to the branch, sticking a branch to the nose may simply describe an insulting physical gesture. It's like giving God the bird. You know what I'm talking about. The other day, man, I was <laughs> the other day I was at the stoplight and, and, and a little and you have these little these old rebellious old people. Tell you, boy, senior citizen. So apparently, I don't know what's happening, man. So, so we were across, uh, the, uh, apparently, the lady was crossing the road. An old lady, senior citizen. But normally you're crossing the intersection, you're supposed to use the, hit the thing, the walker. This lady decided to cross the road right when the light turned green. And so this dude now begins to, to, to blow her, punk, punk, what are you doing? And we are all self. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, that woman turned and gave that man the bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bird you, the old lady. <laughs> I'm saying, everybody started to laugh. I'm like, well, look at her. And guess what? She was taking her time. Yeah, do you hit me? Go ahead and hit me. You but go in jail. Hit me, please hit me. And she gave him the middle finger, the bird. So friends, it's almost like they were giving God the bird. Striking the brand is simple as a figure gesture. Here employed, em, 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 what is that? Enthusiastic, what is that word? Euphemistically. Euphemistically. And I write this, Lord have mercy, right? To express how Yahweh feels about the way the subject have treated him. Friends, other commenters say all that the Lord is saying in this place, that the older, sorry, other commenters say all that the Lord is saying is that in place of pleasing order of honest sacrificial worship, what is what he rece received from Israelite comes as a stench. So there are so many variations, friends. But be what it was, it was offensive to God, them putting their branch 
to the nose. And there today, there are men who are doing wickedness and they dare God, they thump their fists at God. Do something about it, God. Do something about it, God. Now, friends, that was bad. That was insulting. They had offended God. Now, that's the historical. Now, I don't want to dwell too much on the historical because I want to bring this thing to, to 2021. So now we're going to transition now. From the historical, we're going to move on down to the contemporary now. Number five. When will the last abomination of, e of Ezekiel's day have its fulfillment in our day? When? Now, friends, in Revelation chapter 13, <coughs> right? John describes two beasts that rise up out of the earth and the sea. The first beast was a leopard-like beast, you know it. Mouth of a lion, body of a leopard, feet of a bear. It received a deadly wound. We realize that that first beast historically is the Catholic Church system. But another beast came up out of the earth, right? And it, and it revived back the first beast. Now, in Adventist eschatology, in Adventist hermeneutics, we have, dis we have discussed that, that this Revelation 13 points to a time when America, the land of religious liberty, will pass a law that will greatly restrict the movements of God's people. It will greatly impede how we worship God in the beauty of holiness, friends. We know this. In the book of his blood, Keys of His Blood by Malachi Martin. Malachi Martin is an ex-Jesuit, and he is a devoted Roman Catholic, and he wrote this book in honor of Pope John Paul. And the caption says, Keys of the Blood, Pope John Paul versus Russia and the West for control of the New World Order. Clifford Goldstein did a critical analysis of um, Malachi Martin's book. Excellent book, They're the Dragon. And he said in his book, he said this. He said this. John Paul quoted Malachi Martin. He mentioned Seventh-day Adventists in the book. It's in the, seven day Adventists are in the keys of the blood. So what Malachi Martin says now. John Paul looks upon them, us, with a special solicitude, but he knows that as, pardon me, they stand, typo, their future lies down one of two pathways. Seven day Adventists. Either they will remain large in their historical crevices, believing that we are the Antichrist and all that, all, all that factual stuff, hold into their traditions, or as some of them have shown a willingness, or they have decided to accept some forms of merger with the various tide of advancing upon their position. Friends, either we're going to remain true to the historical Revelation 13, as written by Uriah Smith, Stephen Haskell, John Lofbird, A.T. Jones, the Spirit of Prophecy, the Bible, or we're going to do as some have done. Give up that kind of belief and merge with Christian. Friends, listen, I'm telling you, friends, you cannot be neutral about Seventh-day Adventism. Now, so when does Ezekiel chapter 9, Lizzie, Ezekiel 8, have its fulfillment? When will the world, the church, worship the sun? Here is the anti-type fulfillment now. Here it is now. Sit up, please read on. Never did a message. Never did this message apply with greater force than it applies today. This is from volume 7, 141. Here it is now. Never did this message apply with greater force than today. Please read now. More and more, the world is setting at naught the claims of God. Now, she's building now. The world has been, has been where Ezekiel was, step by step. One abomination, another, and another, another. Please read now. Men have become bold in transgression. As in Ezekiel's day, they were bold, thumping their nose at God. Please read now. 
the wickedness of the inhabitants of the world has almost filled up the measure of their iniquity. Iniquity. Please read now. The earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. Now, friends, you have to go back in Ezekiel 8 now. God was patient, but it was a limit. Now, here it is now. She says now, this is, this is when we know that Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 16, 17, 18 will have met its, its anti-type of limit now. Please read now. The what? The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God. The exaltation by mere human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. Stop. What was the last act in the drama in Ezekiel Day? Was it the image of jealousy? No. Was it Tammuz? No. Was it the, 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 those um, hieroglyphics? No. The, la the thing that broke the straw that broke the camel's back was when they began to worship his own friends. All in the world today, LGBTQ, transgender, the violence, all that stuff is bad. But it's not as bad as till they pass a Sunday law. When they pass a Sunday law, the world now, the churches will have met their type when Ezekiel, in Ezekiel day. Please read now, right? She says, When this substitution becomes universal, uh -huh. God will reveal himself. Now remember, where was God? God was between the cherub. You're going to find in Ezekiel 9 now, once they began to worship the son, God got up. He revealed himself now. He went to the door of the third and he called for the man with the rise of ink on. Watch it now. Please read now. He will arise in his majesty. Arise. He's now, he was sitting. Go back in Ezekiel chapter 8. The glory of the God was between the cherub. He was sitting down. Please read now. To shake terribly the earth. Uh huh. He will come out of his place. What was his place? He was between the chair. And you see the parallel. Everything hinges around the Sunday law. Please read now. To punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity. Not just their sin, for their iniquity, for sinning against light and knowledge. Those men knew better. And they did not do better. Friends, you see the parallel, friends? The Sunday law. When it's passed and gone universal, would have met its anti-type in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. Please read now. And the earth shall disclose her blood mm. and shall no more cover her slain. Go back right after, right after verse 18. Verse 19 is slaughter. Yeah. Friends, the parallels are striking. The parallels are striking. One more reference. Volume 5, by the decree. By the decree of enforcing the institution of the papacy uh -huh. in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Now go back in Ezekiel 8. The first apostasy, they were, they were, they were tied to God. Second, they were. Third, they were. But when the fourth one came, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It tells me, friends, over the years, America has been steadily, stealthily, disconnecting herself from God. Slavery, racism, Jim Crow, Bull Connor, genocide, you know it, immorality, step by step. But one, when, uh, when America passed the Sunday law, she would have fully disconnected herself from all righteousness. One more reference now, America, the land of religious liberty. America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath. Which is Sunday. The people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. All right. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Uh huh. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. Friends, that's how we say, you see how Ezekiel 9 has a global application? It appeals to the world, yes. It also appeals to the church. Now, friends, here it is now. T today, as we stand, America is hanging by a thread. Mm. Uncle Sam is, and what's that last thread? Once they pass the Sunday law, pop. Friends, not just America. Today, the Adventist church is hanging on by a thread. Friends, today, you and I are hanging on by a thread. God has been patient with our wickedness. 
and each sin we commit, the, the, the rope is, is cutting. Once America passes, some of our friends, God would have God's favor. God's favor. God's prosperous hands will no longer be over America. Go back to ancient Israel. When they worship the sun, God removed their hands. And friends, I'm telling you, if you think just because we are God's remnant church, it means that God's going to overlook our wickedness, our blatant disregard to his counsels, think again. And if you think being a Seventh-day Adventist will save you, it didn't save Judas. It's not just being in the organization, it's being in the organization and being yoked to Jesus, being obedient to Jesus. We're going to show you. Now, friends, you see the parallel, friends. You see the parallel. Now, one more question now. Number six now. How? How did these 25 men get to the point of worshiping the sun? Friends, listen, I want this to be practical. I want to speak to you now. It's easy to speak about the church, what the church is doing, what they're not doing, about this church and that church and that brother and that sister. I want to speak to you that's watching out there in social media land. How did they get from holiness to sin? How did they get, brothers and sisters, from being virtuous to a point where they now became vile? How? Because, I'm telling you, friends, listen to me now. The reason why the how is important because, friends, how they, how they got there is the same way the world has got there. How did America get to a point where she now feels bold enough to invite the, pape, the Pope to come address, it, address the Congress? How did she get there? Friends, did you know that in America's inception, America had an anti-Catholic stand? As a matter of fact, did you know that when the, when the, um, the, the Washington Monument was being erected, the Catholic Church in Europe sent a block of marble to be included in the Washington Monument. There was outrage in society. And because of the outrage, that the Masons did not hoist the stone. They put the stone in a shed. Feelings were still irate. Some group of men took a chain, took that block of marble, and dumped it in the Potomac River, friends. That's how anti-America was. But how did America get to a point where a majority of the Supreme Court are not Catholic? Friends, how did they get to a point? How did these men get to a point? Because how they got to their point speaks to us. How did you get to a point where you can call now, call wrong, right, and right wrong? How did you get to a point where you think that God doesn't really mean what? How did you get to a point where you can now, where, 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 where wives can now divorce their husbands because he burnt the beans? Who, how did you get to a point, brothers and sisters, where, where, where we think now it's okay for us to put on makeup and jewelry and, 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 and go to, how did you get there? Who has bewitched you? Because I'm telling you, friends, let's go back and trace the steps. How they, because they didn't just wake up one morning and they were there. I'm going to show you how they got to the point. Is the same way the world has got to the point. America has got to the point. And even the church has got to a point today where wrong seems right. And right is called fanaticism. There are three things we must understand. The Bible says that they turn their backs. Now, when a person turn, there are increments. There has to be. Turn to a degree. Right? And from this, I, I deduce three things. How they turn is the same way you and I are turning. Number one, we must understand this. First principle, that no man ever comes or come to sudden ruin. No business just come to bankruptcy. No. No man ever comes to sudden 
ruin. You heard about, oh, he died of a sudden heart attack. That is foolishness. That is, that is, that is, that is incorrect. No, there were steps that there were things that preceded that that, that man overlooked. The heart attack was, was just a culmination. No man dies sudden like that. If you do the autopsy, they'll say, well, it was a clogged artery. Yes. No man, they didn't just suddenly come to that point. Let me give you a Bible. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. The Bible says now, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. Leaven can symbolize the kingdom of God, yes, but leaven can symbolize sin. A little leaven, friends, just a little compromise here, just a little compromise there, here a little, there a little, and you will get there, friends. Little compromise here. I could imagine these men would just begin to rationalize, well, you know, well, you know, and they began to turn. Point number two, it takes time to corrupt the soul. No man is woke up in the morning and he's corrupt. No, Hitler didn't get to Hitlerism overnight. <laughs> you mean, that brother, you, 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 you read Mein Kampf or listen to Mein Kampf. I started to read Mein Kampf while my mind was starting to hurt my mind. I had to put Mein Kampf down. Issues. No, it takes time to corrupt the soul. Watch it now. Songs of Solomon 2.15, the Bible says, Take us, the foxes, the what, Lizzie? Little foxes that spoil the vine. You see over and over that word little. A little leaven. Little, little, little. Friends, it takes time to corrupt the soul. These men did not begin to worship the sun overnight. But in the process of time, they were laying a foundation that would now develop into sun worship. Friends, over the years, America has been step by step laying a foundation for the massive Sunday law. Third point you must consider in how these men got to where they were one departure from principle begins the journey. Friends, listen. If you don't remember anything I've said today, let this be the message. No man ever comes to sudden ruin. It takes time to corrupt the soul. One departure from principle, from principle, from the right, begins the journey. What do you mean? In Isaiah chapter 14, we oftentimes misread this text. The text is about Lucifer. And the question is proposed, and many people think that God is asking a question out of not knowing. But rather, it's almost like an astonishment. Look at the text. He asked himself the question now. How art thou fallen? It's not like, I don't know. Durr, I'm God. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, dude, like how in the world did you allow this to happen given your expertise? How in the world did you allow those people to, 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 to ponzi scheme you? Huh? How in the world, like... A man of your expertise, a man of your, uh, your maturity. So it's not that God doesn't know. It's almost, almost an agassment. <gasps> like how? You know, we are told before Lucifer fell, there were some feelings that were developing in him. Ellen White says, they were strange. And he should have gone to God and said, God, you know, I'm having these feelings. I need your help, friends. And then the question, how art thou fallen? How did you get to the point where you are right now, where you think it is okay for you to go out and marry somebody who's not a 7 Or even to go into business with somebody that's a 7 How did you get there? 
How did we get to a point, friends? It is, go back to the principle, no man ever comes to the ruin. It takes time to corrupt the soul. One departure from principle begins the journey. Friends, how did these 25 men get to the point where there were priests in the sanctuary one day, then they're worshiping Baal the next, fill it in now, by a little compromise here and there. And friends, I'm telling you, when the Seventh-day Adventist church, when we, well not we, well some of them as a people, embrace Sunday, it won't be an overnight thing. C.D. Brooks once said it, that Neo-Pentecostalism will be the death of black Seventh-day Adventism. Friends, we are seeing it now, and I'm not being critical, I'm being factual. We're seeing that the Adventist church, some of the members and the institutions, not all, some, are slowly but surely turning their backs toward the, to the east and they are getting ready to worship the sun. How did they get there? How are they doing it, friends? The first indication is through ecumenicalism. What is ecumenicalism? Ecumenicalism is a merging or coming together of different religious, relig religious groups on common points of doctrine. Friends, ecumenicalism is so heavy and rampant. It wasn't always that, you know. It wasn't always like that. And ecumenicalism, we've told you, ecumenicalism is an insult to the second angel's message. And people who support ecumenicalism cannot preach the second angel's message. Second angel says, come out of Babylon. Ecumenical says, you stay in Babylon. I'm going to have my Easter program. I'm going to invite you to preach. We're going to do a thing called the seven last words. And so you can preach on the first and they unite. Friends, almost every major evangelistic campaign that is done, especially in North America, look on the flyer. Who do you have? You always have uh, some Sunday singer who is steeped in Babylon, don't have a clue about nothing. They are paid for their vocal. Friends, that is wrong. The Bible says, what fellowship have light with darkness? Doesn't the Bible says, come out from among them and be he separate? That is wrong. And friends, we're seeing it not being critical 2014. Seventh-day Adventism and Roman Catholic service interfaith worship held between Seventh-day Adventist and Roman Catholic. Friends, this is turning one departure from principle. We're told on Wednesday, 2014, an ecumenical service took place on the Black Seventh-day Adventist Church. Participants came from six different denominations. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Congregational, and Methodist. The theme was to celebrate Lent. What? What? Not the Lent in Tammuz. Couldn't be that Lent. A Catholic tradition where ash is applied to the forehead in preparation for Easter Sunday, friends. And this pastor was not reprimanded. As a matter of fact, I have discovered the more, the more evil you do is the more you're affirmed. You want to remain long in the church on payroll, do wrong. <laughs> it's a, you do wrong. Do wrong and you will, you will live out your retirement. You do right if they can't ship you to Timbuktu, boy, they'll keep you suppressed. It's a fact. Friend, this man was not written up. He was not bad. He, nothing. And then you had these, these unfortunate people allowing the, this is the, he's hugging the Catholic. I'm not saying you, a man can't hug a Catholic. I'm not saying that. But when you come on to theology and this unfortunate woman stood there and had this Catholic priest put tea for Tammuz on their forehead, weeping for Tammuz, ecumenicalism. And friends, they said, it's, today, listen, it is the order of the day. You look at all these Zoom programs and all these little buzz. Friends, just go on. It, is, it is a norm now. And we don't realize when we support ecumenicalism on that level, friends, we are surely, but slowly but surely, turning away, turning our backs towards God, and we're getting ready to embrace Sunday. 
One more tenant, these strange worship patterns in our churches. Friends, where did it come from? These mantras we're seeing over and over and one hook over and over and, and this nakedness and decadence. Friends, it's just like the heathens. These cliche sermons. It's not your time, it's your turn. What, what, what in the world? What does that have to do with the judgment? It's all you hear. These play on words and they little sound bites. They play on your emotions. Books promoted. We're not encouraging people to read the Puritans of Thomas Watson and these Puritans and Spirit of Prophecy. We're promoting these little... Nah, man, it's not, boy, I, tell you, I, I went to one, one, one pastoral... pastoral uh, when I, you know, when I was working with the brethren and the books they gave me, friends, I'm going to be honest. I didn't want to throw them away. I just put them in a drop box. The friends, pure evangelicals. And I, I, I said to myself, I was saying to Brother Austin, if it, was, if it was some Puritan, some Spurgeon, some Baxter, some Watson, you know what I'm saying? Some Luther, it wouldn't be so bad. But Joe Blow out there because he has a big church in Texas. Who is that guy? I don't know. Friends, we are turning. Then we have this gender role leadership confusion. Confusion in the church. Confusion. We are turning. Turning. The permissiveness. Friends, it's almost... I have... Listen, I have... I have never, I never believed that I would live to see it. That anything goes in the church. Saints, you want to show up naked to church on Sabbath, literally. You show up, literally. You want to wear a spandex to church one Sabbath, you can do that. And nobody will say, boy, sister, listen, you know, honestly, we don't, but that, 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 no, no. We don't want to offend anybody. And, 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 you know, and, and Spurgeon says, <laughs> Spurgeon says the good people are not alienated. The skeptical are conciliated, conciliated, and the rich people are, 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 are whatever I forgot. But the point is, everything is made pleasant, well round. The level of permissiveness in our schools, it is like what in the world is where are the leaders? The blatant disregard of the prophetic counsels. Friends, they didn't even want to hear Ellen White. It's almost like you mentioned Ellen White, you're mentioning Jim Jones. You're mentioning Ted Bundy. You're mentioning Adolf Hitler. There is a hatred, and we're told, friends, one of the things that will let us know that many will keep Sunday, she says, one thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand on the Satan's banner Sunday will first give up the reproof, the warning, the counsels contained in the testimonies. All those priests who worship the sun, they had turned their backs on Jeremiah's counsel. Friends, this is where we are, friends. Elder Moses Mason gave us this one. This is where we are, friends. This is where the world is. This is where the church is, and this is where the people of God are. And you think this is a joke? How do I know that majority of us will turn our backs to the east and keep Sunday? I want you to consider these statements. Please read that now. This is from Volume 5 as we bring this thing to a close. Volume 5. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. Uh-huh. The mark of the beast will be urged upon. Here it is, Sunday worship, the sun. Here it is now. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands uh -huh. and conformed to worldly customs. There it is. Step, remember I told you, step by step. We're dressing like the world, eating like the world, we marry like the world, we do business like the world, we live like the world, we eat like the world, and we're going to die but like the world. Step by step. No man comes to sudden ruin. Those priests didn't wake up on morning and say, Oh, I'm going to worship the sun. No. Please read now. She says now. Will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be. All right. Rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened, imprisonment, and death. They turn. Now, friends, this one. You know, friends, I'll tell you something. 
you know, did, I, I started to do some grad school work. I started my master's in, in, in counseling. And so, you know, you tend to read some clinical books and so forth about the mind. But the more I read the spirit of prophecy, this woman really, this woman could have been a psychologist, true psychologist. Her statements are so impeccable. Look at this one now about step by step how these men got to where they were and how many of us are getting to where we, we are right now. She says, I read now, the mind of a man or woman does not come down in a moment from purity and holiness to depravity, corruption and crime. It's not overnight. It's not. It doesn't happen like that. She says now, it takes time, T-I-M-E, to transform the human to the divine or to degrade those formed in the image of God to the brutal or satanic. Friends, stop there. It takes time to corrupt the soul. She says, now by beholding, you become changed. And friends, you, you, you sit down, you begin to watch TBN and Daystar and Word. You pattern, you watch these things as pastors now, as leadership. We now begin to say, let's run our churches like them. She says, uh, 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 um, though forming the image of his maker, man can so educate his mind that sin which he once loathed will become pleasant to him. As he ceases, and this is it now, friends. This is how these men got to where they were and how the world is going to where they were, how we are now. As he sees to watch and pray, miss your morning devotion, miss prayer meeting, miss fasting, miss meditation, miss contemplation, reflection. As you miss, he sees now to guard the citadel of his heart and engages in sin or crime. Friends, now turn the card over. If it takes time to corrupt the soul. It also takes time to create the soul in righteousness. That is why beware of these deathbed confession. The foolish virgin tells us. They are woken. Five says, give us of your oil. I can't give you my oil because character is not transferable. And then we find this one. Not in your handout. Jot it down, please. Now, Senator, please read on 608 now as the storm approaches. As the storm approaches, a large class will have professed faith. I'm sorry. As the, storm, as the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position. So why do they turn? Why do they now turn? And, and these are people who are Seventh-day Adventists who affirmed the Sabbath, who taught the Sabbath. These were tithe paying, chickless eating, tofu eating. How did they, what happened? Why would they now give up the Sabbath and keep Sunday? Check the levels now. By what? Uniting with the world in dress, in meditation, and partaking of its spirit. They have now come to view matters within the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to what? To choose the easy path. Friends, when the Sunday law is passed, majority of the church will give up the Sabbath and keep Sunday. Majority of our school's leadership will give up and keep Sunday. Only a few will remain loyal. How? Why? There it is. There it is. Friends, we need to pray and ask God to keep us focused on Jesus and ask God to cultivate an obedient spirit within us. Number seven. Now, what does Ezekiel chapter eight, as we close now, tell us about the character and the nature of God? It is one thing I want to highlight amongst other about the nature of God that I have taken away from Ezekiel eight is this now. And Job speaks of it, you know. Job speaks of it in Job 28, 38 verse 11. Job says, and he says, hither shall thou come, but no further. Friends, when we think of God, there's one thing it tells me. Fill it in now that, that he has, fill it in, uh, is that on the screen, that he has a limit. Friends, Ezekiel chapter 8, 
verses 1 through 18 tells me one takeaway point, and there are many points you can take away, but one thing I want you to take away is that God has his limit. You know, in Ezekiel chapter 8, the first abomination, what do we see God? We see God being what? He's patient. He's rebuking, but he's patient. The second abomination, as they, this is one when, when they, um, image of jealousy, the second one now, well, the, the, pardon me, the second one should be the images in the, in the room, right? God is patient. Wasn't he patient? He was patient. The, the, the third one, which should be the other one, we see God is patient. But friends, when the fourth abomination hit the, hit the stage, God says, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Look what she says, these powerful statements now. Please read the world. The world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long forbearance, men have trampled upon his authority. Friends, because God was forbearing in Ezekiel 8, what did they do? They didn't stop. One abomination after another. After, and so the world. Because God doesn't intervene, we get bold in sin. Please read now. They have? They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, How doth God know? There it is, thump in the nose. Please read now. And is there knowledge in the Most High? But there is a line beyond which they cannot pass. She goes on to say? The time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. What is the limit? We know the limit is the law. Once the law is passed... Just as in Ezekiel day, the limit was when they turned their backs to, friends, I'm, re, I'm, I'm overemphasizing it. There are parallels. The limit was the sun. Sun worship, Sunday worship legalized. Please read now. Even now, they have almost exceeded the bounds of the long suffering of God. They're almost, friends, we see these laws being passed, new green deal, this deal, save the earth. All these things are just getting us closer to the Sunday law. Please read now. The limits of his grace. The limits of his mercy. Uh -huh. The Lord will interpose to vindicate his own honor. Uh -huh. To deliver his people. Yes. And to repress the swellings of unrighteousness. Is a limit. One more reference. Conflict and courage says the flames that consume the cities of the plain shed their warning light down to our time. We are taught the faithful, fearful and solemn lesson. That while God bears long with the transgressor, there is a L-I-M-I-T limit beyond which men may not go. What was their limit, Lizzie, back then? The sun, when they worship the sun, what's our limit today? The sun, the law. That's the limit, right? When that limit is reached, she says, the mercies, the offer of mercies are withdrawn and the ministration for judgment begins. Mm -hmm. Friends, we are almost here. As a matter of fact now, when God saw the last abomination, look what God said to Ezekiel now. And this is now an introduction to Ezekiel 9. Therefore, God says, Ezekiel, get the belt. I go and deal in fury. Mine eyes will not, this is God, you know, will not spare. Neither will I have pity. And though they cry and bawl and say, God, say, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, God. With a loud voice, I will not hear. Because of the great idolatrous sins of Jerusalem, and that the people regarded it as a trivial thing, God's judgment was assured and could not be turned back. Friends, fill it in now. Number one, their evil will cause God to pour out his wrath. His wrath, the wrath came in Ezekiel 9. 
What is the wrath today? Revelation 15. Clock the dots. Point number two. Their evil will cause God to show no pity. No pity. Morgan in his commentary on Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 18 says, because of this utter corruption of the people, Jehovah would proceed in judgment in spite of all them loud crying of the people. Oh, God, him. <laughs> Pity, mercy, Jesus. Oh, God. No. Bolak, this is deep. Bolak in his commentary of Ezekiel 18 says this now. Yahweh hereby affirms that from now on, his ears are closed to all pleas for mercy. Catch the last line now. He will not allow his heart to be over to overrule his head. Did you, did you get it, friends? Did you get the pathos? Oftentimes, as parents, when we are spanking our children, when they start trembling like a leaf, pity me, say, your room, man. Because you, 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 you pity. Friends, the heart overruled the head. But God is saying, no, Balak said, listen, he will not allow his heart to overrule his head. Well, what then? You know, one of the most meaningful statements that I have ever read, and every time I read it, it really speaks to my heart. Ellen White wrote this to a minister, to a church. One of her last visions she wrote to the church, it, it is so profound. If you listen to it, it's almost like a, a mother making a final appeal to her child and even even how the, the words are freighted you can see it it is it is really an appeal it's found in volume five and volume five as a matter of fact i'm going to give you a homework assignment this is your reading assignment you need to go home and read volume five the chapter the seal of god you need to read that because that now will give you a heads up as we dive into ezekiel 9 out of all the testimonies, the, the two most serious ones that I've, I've read, which really are serious, volume 5 and volume 9. No, you need to, you need to read, yes, read the whole volume, but for this study, read volume 5. The chapter is called The Seal of God. Read because she, she, she comments on Ezekiel 8 and Ezekiel 9, and we're going to take a lot of her uh, comments from that to next week's sermon. Now, she says this now, the patience of God has an object, but you are defeating it. So picture God writing to you right now. You right now in your home, God sent you a letter. You open it up, you sit down, addressed to you. This is God speaking to you. Not so much the church, God is speaking to you and me this morning now as we close now. She says the patience of God is an object, but you're defeating it. He is allowing a state of things to come that you would fain see counteracted by and by, but it will be too late. Get this now. God commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Heziel, king over Syria, that he might be a source of scourging to idolatrous Israel. Why is it you're being harassed at the job so much? God is using your boss to prick you. Why are you having problems with your children? God is using Heziel to prick you, to prick you, to prick you. Why is God prospering you? Because he wants to save you. He said, look, look at what I'm doing for you. And look what you're giving me in return. Here is now. Who knows? Whether God will not give you up to deception which you love. Who knows that God, you, 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 okay, you, you want to believe that God is calling people out of his church to join some little group down there? You want to believe that? Who knows that God will not allow you to believe that just as how the, the Pope believed he's God? 
So he, he will allow it, you know. Allow you to believe that. Give you up to the deception which you love. She says, who knows? But that the preachers who are faithful and firm and true may be the last who shall offer their gospel of peace to our unthankful churches. She says, it may be that, that the destroyers are already training under the hands of Satan and only wait the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their position. And with the voice of false prophet cry, peace, peace, when the Lord hath not spoken. She says, I seldomly weep. Now I find my ears blinded with tears. They are falling upon my paper as I write. It may be, it may be ere long all prophesying, all present truth among us will come to an end. And the voice which have stirred the people may no longer disturb their carnal slumber. Friends, all prophesying came to an end in Ezekiel chapter 8. Then now she speaks this so serious. She says, when God shall work his strange work on the earth. What is that? Stay tuned. When his holy hand, when, when holy hands shall bear the ark no longer. And Ellen White says that there are some preachers now in the churches will never lift up their voice to warn their congregation about the doom. They have now charted a path which there is no return. She says, Woe will be upon the people. O oh, that thou hadst known even thou in this day the things that belong to thy peace. O oh, that our, peep, our people may did O oh, oh, that our people may as, may as did Nineveh repent with all their might and believe with all their hearts that, that God may turn away his fierce anger. And when you read on down, she appeals to the parents about allowing their, who allow their children to take on this worldly mindset. She read it on in the chapter volume, volume five is so serious. She appeals to the parents to have their children develop that relationship with Jesus, brothers and sisters. This is where we are, friends. And I believe that today we are living in the final verse. Verses of Ezekiel 8, verses 16 through 18. When you read 2 Chronicles 36, the Bible says that God sent prophets, but there was no remedy. As I close, I want to leave you something to think about. You may want to take a picture of it because it's so like a brain freeze. I want you to think about this quote as I close from Mr. Spurgeon. Spurgeon comments on Ezekiel 8, you know. It's amazing. It's amazing with accuracy. It's amazing. And he draws some sharp parallels on it. My Lord. And I want to read a phrase that Spurgeon wrote commenting on the text in 2 Chronicles 36, no remedy. Look what Spurgeon said, so profound. He said, well, let me correct it first because I, I see a mistake. I don't want to butcher it. Let me give it to you as how I read it. All right, here it is now. As I close, Spurgeon said this now. They degraded the remedy because they underestimated the disease. You see, you, 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 you didn't get that. You, 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 you didn't get it. But let me read it again. Spurgeon said of ancient Israel in Ezekiel 8, they degraded the remedy because they underestimated the disease. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. The world behind me, 
the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. I believe we have a few questions. Now, if you ask a question, and I'm going to answer it in the upcoming three lectures, I will defer to answer so you can get the fullness. All right, go ahead, Sister Nat. Amen. Praise God for that powerful message. Um, a few of our questions, the first of which, SKB mm -hmm. writes, what does Ezekiel 8.17 mean that God's people filled the land with violence? All right, fill the land with violence. We, we, we talked about it, that we believe that, that because the priests were, were not fulfilling righteousness, then they were not enforcing righteousness. You see? And so if you're not enforcing righteousness, then, by, then lawlessness will, um, will happen. It can also mean because of their actions now, uh, vengeance would have come. But most commenters believe that a state of chaos, and we, we looked at it, if, if you have your lesson, we looked at it that a, a state of chaos happened in society as a result of the priests not being true to their obligation. So there could have been physical violence, yes, but a state of disorder, discombobulance, a state of unrighteousness was happening in Israel. And, and violence, murder, is the fruit of unrighteousness. Right? All right, go ahead. Okay, thank you. SKB goes on to ask two other questions. Mm -hmm. The first one, in volume six of the testimonies, page 395, the prophet of God appeared to make a difference between the force of conscience and the Sunday law. Uh -huh. Could it be that this forced vaccine is one example? Soon it will be forced? Well, you know, there's a lot we can learn from the whole COVID-19 vaccine. Now, you know, what, while you're on that, let, let me just say this. Um, and I'm going to answer your question. I think most of us are confused about vaccine. And I think because we, we, we jump on a hype. Now, let me, let me be clear. And I can speak unequivocally. I don't believe that I'm, I'm speaking from, from a Jamaican audience perspective now. I can't speak for any ethnicity. I don't believe that Jamaicans by large are anti-vaccine. Anti-vaccine means you've never been vaccinated. Most Jamaicans were vaccinated. Before we came to school, we had to be vaccinated. And even to come to America, you had to be vaccinated. So I think we're confused. Now, I am an anti-vaccine by no means. I've never avowed that. If I was anti-vaccine, I wouldn't have gotten vaccinated, period. What? I think I am. This is what I am. I am anti rush COVID vaccine in the sense that I don't believe that studies have been given enough. It was a, a rush approval, and they're still trying to figure out the long term effects. And most people who jump on this anti COVID vaccine, they don't know what they're anti. Are they anti vaccine? Or are they anti-COVID vaccine? No, you can't be both. Because if you're, if you're anti-vaccine means you've never been vaccinated. Right? And so I think we're confused now. On the COVID issue now, I believe that out of the COVID, laws were, laws were implemented. Yes. And we can see that it is easy for the nations to get on the same page. So my dear brother, yes, I believe that uh, while the COVID is not the mark of the beast... I believe that we can see, even with the COVID, that one, uh, given a major crisis, nations can get on the same wavelength. And because nations want to prosper, they will do whatever it deems necessary to bring back prosperity. And Ellen White says there are two things that will pass the Sunday law. 
She says, divine favor and temporal prosperity. So, yes, my brother, I believe that, th that there are some things that we can learn that may come out of the COVID-19 policies that were passed behind, behind the scenes that are laying the foundation for the Sunday law. But by and by, the COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. And it's not the Sunday law. No, no. All right, listen, we're not, we, we don't want get, to get, get caught off in the vaccine to, to each his own will. I am not signing up for the vaccine. Definitely, I'm going to hold out until the, I'll be the last, the last one on the last line. I'm hoping that who want to take it and take it. And it's, it's people's prerogative, right? If a man receives the market, the, 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 receive the vaccine, it doesn't mean he's an antichrist. It doesn't mean he's a sinner. It's his personal choice. There are some who teach that because a man get the vaccine or a pastor, the pastor has apostatized. Come on, man. That, 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 that is like, that, that, that is the height of stupidity. It is. It's the height of stupidity. It is, the, and, and, and it, is, it is ignorant. It's dark. Okay? We are free moral agents. Right? And I, I don't want us now to, to get so enamored by the vaccine that we neglect the poor, the needy, the fatherless, the widows, to do good to those that need good, even in the ranks of our church. Let's not become distracted. The three angels' messages is a message for this time. And within that, we do encourage folks to obey the laws of health, strengthen your immune system, etc., etc., etc. Well said, Pastor. Thank you. SKB's third question, Evangelist. I've been following you on the studies on Ezekiel. You have advised God's people to stay in the church. Mm -hmm. But with all this apostasy, how can we? Should we just go from church to church? All right. What's his name again? SKB. 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 Now, I am a... Listen. You know, I, and I will say this, and it's so sad that, you know, I came from the old school. And I was heavily influenced by men like C.D. Brooks, J. Malcolm Phillips, um, 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 uh, what's another name? Um, uh, Samuel, Samuel Thomas Sr., Moses Mason, who nourished in Jesus. These men were hardcore preachers of righteousness, right? And they never encouraged others to separate themselves from the organization and it's unfortunate that many of the people who are now advocating that were they themselves sat under these men ate from their table it's a shame now ezekiel 8 is, is, is a template where was god in he was in the midst of jerusalem god did not leave now what i would say if you are attending a church and things are bad, and some churches are, are really bad, I would not sub, su suggest you to su subject yourself and your children, your family to that. You can easily well take your membership and find another church within the confines of the structure and work with it. You're not going to find a perfect church. Now, guess what now? Trees, if you plant a tree, my brother, in your backyard and you uproot it today plant it the next day uproot it Monday plant it Tuesday and you keep on uproot uproot what happened you will develop no fruit and you will not grow so I discourage church hopping I discourage that I, I am I'm encouraging you find a church that, that you can work with and it's not gonna be perfect by no means but you can yield your influence and it may be when you get there, they are slow to certain truths. Be patient with them because God was patient with you. By tact, by diplomacy, you can, by the grace of God, bring, God can use you to bring them up to where we all are to be. Now, again, I want to qualify. There are some church plant groups that are out there that they have not been grafted in not because they don't want to because a 
the process is slow, or two, the church may deem them a threat, then I have to leave them to God. Cases are different, but there are some churches out there who, who have, who, who make, who don't want to be affiliated, and then they use their position and their platform. All they do every Sabbath, every day, is find the dirt in the church, put it on social media, that's their sermon topic. God does not do that with us. How would you like if someone, and again, who is putting their dirt out there? All of us have sinned. Come on now. Even Ellen White, when she wrote to people, the letters were confidential. She didn't put them on blast, brothers and sisters. I'm telling you, and if we, and if we emulate that spirit, we're going to be cut down in Ezekiel chapter 9. So my brother, I am appealing to you. By no means are we to separate from the organized church. You support the church in your time, your talent, your time, your tithes, as how, as how God reveals it to you, right? But I am not advocating anyone to separate themselves from the organized churches and to join some group around there and you follow speakers. This man come in town, you follow him. This man come in town, you follow her. No, get involved in the church. You have talents, you have gifts. Join a department, whether PM, whatever your gift is, help to grow the church and help to win souls in the community. That's the mission of the church. Anything else, stay far from it because I'm telling you, they will come to naught. They will come to naught, right? Amen. In that same vein, Sheridan writes, so if I'm not a part of the organization, I won't be saved? Well, Brother Sheridan, no one is saying that. We will not be saved in God's kingdom because of disobedience. Okay? Now, church membership is biblical. Church membership is biblical. The spirit of prophecy supports that. And if you have the opportunity and the ability to join yourself to a church and you do not, then you have to take up with God. Right? Disobe we'll be lost because of disobedience. Right? The Bible says they add it to the church daily. Church membership is biblical. As a good Christian, we want to be attached to a local church. Let's not go renegade. Let's follow what God says. And I'm going to tell you something. We will not be lost because we wear makeup, because we divorce and get remarried, because we, 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 because we go here, because we go there, because we are offshoot, no shoot, parachute, because we are a conference church. We'll be lost because of disobedience. And my disobedience may not be yours. Okay? We may not be, um, you know, dancing, running a golden calf, but we may be deficient in other areas of our lives. You see, my brother, you see what I'm saying? Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, and it's me, O oh God, in need of prayer. Let's pray for our brethren. And when God gives us a platform to, re to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, may we do it in the spirit of humility. Consider ourselves, lest we be tempted. Amen. David would like to know, was there a Sunday law in Ezekiel 8 and 9, or did they just worship the sun on their own? Well, they, they, they worship. It wasn't a Sunday law per se. Remember we discussed, my brother, that type and anti-type are never identical. They're only parallels. But they did worship the sun and i could imagine they taught others to worship the sun today the anti-type is the sunday law there was no sunday law in in, in ezekiel's day they just worship the sun and they knew better in our day the anti-type is the sunday law being passed universally and many now who know better join the ranks and keep sunday remember going to church on sundays is not a sin because the bible says god winks at ignorance a lot of people are going to church tomorrow, they don't know. They are sincere Christian, God loves them and we love them. But when light has come to their knowledge, if they continue, then God now takes them from the category of ignorance and puts them in the category of rebellion. And that's a different whole kettle of fish or can of worms, <laughs> for lack of a word. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, Danetti. 
would like to know, is the church and the organization the same? He's thinking of the 144,000. Uh, you know, we hear these people, these, these smart Alex amongst us, they try to be clever. And they try to, well, the church is an organization. Come on, friends, listen, man. Come on, what, what, what are we doing? And when they use these words, the church is wanting an organization, you know what? They're trying to justify their, 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 um, their stand. Now, what is an organization? Is this a body of people governed by laws, right? Of course, the we, are the we are the church, but we are part of an organization. So we don't want to splice and dice and get complicated, friends. Listen, God has a remnant church, the Seventh Adventist his church. What do you want to call it? Organize or what? God expects us to remain within the structure, right? To support the structure. Not just support it blindly, but to ask questions, to hold our leaders in accountability. And if things get bad like Jesus, they threw him out of the temple. Where did he go? He didn't start Jesus' church. The Bible says he went down to Nazareth, Galilee, and he went back to a same conference church. Friends, we have no excuse. I'm appealing to you, my sister. Listen, we need to stop watching this on YouTube. Read for yourself and stop letting these men, these ministries who have their agenda, inoculate you with their agenda. That's what they're doing. They are feeding their poison in your mind. And you don't know you've been poisoned. How did you get to a point to think that God is actually calling people out of his church to your little two-member church in Pocomania? You, man, you can't even live stream straight. You can't, even get, you can't even get your slides straight. How in the world are you going to finish the work? Are you crazy? You're too late. You don't have the manpower, woman power. You don't even have the life to do that. Three score and ten. Come on, saints, man. Let, 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 and, 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 you know, when we, see, when we see mature people getting duped, it's just, it's just mind-boggling. Listen, I am not going anywhere. And I'm telling you something. My life, friends, listen, I have had enough happen to me in this church. If I was weak and man, be pamby and spineless, I would have got out of Dodge a long time ago. But you know what? God never told us it's going to be easy. But he did say his grace is sufficient, friends. Mm -hmm. And people who have done ill to me, some of them are dead. I didn't pray for that. I pray for them. And you know what? I've, I told you, I have known men, presidents, who have said to me, you will never preach in this conference again. I didn't rob anybody, rape anybody, molest anybody, steal any money, none of that stuff. Because of what I'm preaching. And I have lived to see that same president eat his words. That same president was forced to invite me back to his church and he had to subject himself to my teaching and he was the question and answer man. And you know, by and by, we talked. We that same president offered me a job, literally. He offered me a J-O-B. It's too late. I don't hate the man because we're fighting not against flesh and blood and I pray for him. He's a very nice guy, but I understand sometimes as a president, you, sometimes pressure reach you. And, you, and, and what happened now? You shut out the sinners. Then you shut out the saint and shut in the sinners. But we pray for each other that God will help us to get on the same page. Amen. That was plain, Pastor. Praise God. Aaron would like to know, if they tell you you can't come in the church if you're not wearing a mask, what should you do? All right, there you go. Now, Aaron, listen, man, you know, I believe that the, the mass thing will subside. Now, COVID is real, whether you think so or not. No, I, I travel a lot. I travel, and if I am COVID positive, I can't get on the flight. So what I do? In my home, I don't wear a mask. But when I go out, I put a mask. I don't wrap my face up where I can't breathe. Now, come on, now. we're not getting fanatical. If I'm around people, I don't know where you, where you have been. You may have caught the COVID. So I have to protect myself because I have to travel. If I am COVID positive, I cannot get on the airplane. I have business to t attend to, serious business for the Lord's work. So I have to take precautions. So what I'll do, if a church requires me to wear a mask, I just put it on my, yeah, come on, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to, come on, man. You know, we're fighting the wrong thing. You should be fighting against sin. And I'm hoping that the same stance we take against wearing a mask, we take the same stance against sin because it's, it is hypocritical. For us now to be so vehement against some mass while in our own homes we're along wickedness. That is, that is madness. Let's be fair now. Let's, come on, man. I, I'm not imposing mass on anybody. But, you know, you wear it, you put it on your face. I'm not saying I, I can't breathe. Come on now. Now, when we open up, 
I'm wearing my mask because I don't know where you have been. I don't know who you have been in contact with. And because I travel a lot, especially out of the country, and where I'm going, if, I, if you're COVID positive, you ain't getting on that JetBlue flight. And when I get to where I'm at, if I am positive, I ain't getting back to my family. That ain't going to work. So I take my precautions for me. So if a church asks to wear the mask, don't fight it. The mask won't last forever. It won't last forever. Just, you know, listen, don't get, let's, let's not fight the wrong fights. Now, while we can force people, now if you feel that you wearing a mask is going to compromise your health and cause you to breathe less, well, that's, that's, that's your thing. And every man has to do what's right for him. But let's not lose focus on the real issue, the coming crisis, and what we need to do to prepare for it and prepare others. Amen. 3AM wants to know who wrote the book Evangelism. Evangelism is a compilation. It's a compilation um, of Ellen White's writing. It was put together by the Ellen White Estates. Now, again, the dangers of compilation is that one potential danger, you may take a, a paragraph out of its context to mean something. So as you read evangelism, it's, it's, it's a compilation. You know, it's good to go back and try to get these paragraphs in their original source so you're not misguided or misguided. But it's a compilation by the White Estate to put it this way, C.D. Brooks says, Ellen White didn't write evangelism, she wrote everything in, in evangelism. Right? Amen. All right? Saints, listen, uh, what can we say? If God be for us, who can be against us? Friends, I hope that the sermon was a blessing, that you know where we're going right now. And I do look forward to next Sabbath. We're, we're going to break down who was the writer's inkhorn by his side? Who are these six men? Who, what does it mean to sigh and cry? Who are the ancient men? And we will see if we can get some, some context to Ezekiel chapter 9. Loving Father in heaven, O oh God, what can we say to these things? But God have mercy upon us. Because Lord, you know, we are, we've all sinned. And some of us are still sinning. And we need help. We have, we have rationalized, we have compromised until today in our own personal lives, Lord. We don't have the fervor, the love which we once had when we just met Jesus. Through a little compromise here and there, our goal has become dim. And God, we need a revival. And that revival will not come by beholding apostasy, talking about it, gossiping, it will, it will come only by our hearts being surrendered to Jesus and seeing our own need for us to put away sin, to gather our children together, to have consistent morning and evening worship, to surround ourselves in an atmosphere which is conducive for spiritual growth. Lord, help us, we pray. We pray for the organization, Lord. I sincerely pray for Elder Ted Wills. It is not easy to lead a stiff, naked people. And while he's not perfect, Lord, I know you love him. And you want him to be saved in your kingdom. And I pray for him that what, whatever tenor he has left, he will call a solemn assembly. Whatever wrongs he has made, he will right those wrongs for Jesus' sake. We pray for our institutions, Lord. You know the follies that we, are, we have allowed to come in, Lord, and we're, we're, we're where we are now. Lord, please help us. We don't want to be in a wrong position when you arise to shake the earth. We want to be hidden Jesus and with his righteousness. Be with us now, we pray, and keep us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, saints, listen, it was well to be here. I hope you were blessed. Again, be like the Bereans. Go back and study these things to see if they are so. Um, I look forward to see you tomorrow night by God's grace. Enjoy the Sabbath. Enjoy your Sabbath lunch. Go for a nature walk. The Sabbath sun sets a little bit later tonight so you can enjoy God in nature and learn of nature's God. As of always, in the words of Job, the patriarch, I say, behold, the eye forward.